Good afternoon, Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> my name's Danny Whitaker. This is my own worst enemy, the world's greatest mental health podcast. Mm, we're getting there. Uh, episode eight, panic disorder and agoraphobia on the agenda for today. Here to discuss those topics with me is Professor Vijaya Manikavasaga. Uh, Vijaya is the Director of Psychological Services and Director of the Psychology Clinic at the Black Dog Institute. She's Associate Professor at the School of Psychiatry at the University of New South Wales. And she's also the lead investigator in a series of studies on the development and implementation of wellbeing programs in schools in Australia. Uh, she's also involved in the development of several apps and online programs as part of a project called uh, Digital Dog, which is a, a research group within the Black Dog Institute working to use technology to solve mental health problems. Now, one of these projects is uh, an app called Spark, which we actually touch upon a little bit in today's episode. Uh, it, it's basically an app which helps you kind of discover your core life values and then helps you take steps towards implementing those values into your everyday life so that you can basically, you know, feel more content and fulfilled in life. So depending when you're listening to this, Vijay actually mentioned that they might be looking for people to test this app sometime soon. So when that time comes around, I'll be putting a link in the show notes for you guys so you can go and sign up to the testing program, you know, if you fancy yourself one of these kind of early adopter types or whatever. Anyway, the reason I contacted Vidya for this particular episode is because amongst all those other achievements, she's also the co-author of yet another book, Weighing Down My Kindle, Overcoming Panic and Agoraphobia, which is, of course, the twin topic for today's discussion. Now, in all fairness, I think uh, agoraphobia probably deserves its own episode, uh, and we only kind of discuss it very briefly today um, as it ties into panic disorder. But I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough squeezing one condition into an hour's episode at the minute, never mind two. So, you know, if you're one of those people for whom agoraphobia is your thing, like it was for me, don't worry, you'll be getting your own episode at some point. We'll, we'll get to it. So it's, it's been interesting listening back to this episode because I actually recorded it before my recent relapse back into generalized anxiety and having panic attacks and all that stuff, which are... I think I mentioned in the, the last episode. So uh, during this discussion, you actually hear me uh, talking about having panic attacks kind of in the past tense. And yeah, now here I'm kind of back in the thick of it. So, you know, doing better, but, you know, still kind of having it rough. But I have to say, being back in the thick of it now and, and, and listening to this episode, it's made me very uh, cognizant of the, the need to kind of crack on with some more how to episodes so you know episodes focusing like purely on on practical advice so yeah that's kind of what what I'm, I'm aiming for in the in the new year to make a lot more like solution based episodes i mean you know we're only kind of eight episodes in still very much laying the foundations with this first round of episodes and just kind of introducing you to the basic concepts of mental health but yeah, this, this past month has, has certainly been a reminder of how important it is to kind of provide people with, you know, actual steps to take and not just purely abstract information. Now, don't get me wrong, today's episode isn't completely devoid of practical advice. Uh, we do talk about things like uh, acceptance, distraction and, uh, oh, panic surfing. Yes. Uh, and now I'm back on the panic wagon myself. I can certainly attest to the effectiveness of some of these techniques, particularly the last one. They do work. I was doing a bit of a panic surfing in the car yesterday, feeling like I was going to die in a traffic jam, uh, but yet feeling like it, but not believing it. That's the, that's the key with panic surfing. Anyway, getting ahead of ourselves. So today's episode, we discuss the psychology and physiology behind panic disorder. What are panic attacks and why do they happen? Uh, can panic attacks kill you? Can they send you crazy, quote unquote? Or are they just a completely harmless, albeit horrendous, natural bodily function? We discuss how panic disorder and agoraphobia are related, uh, how and why the one develops into the other, and most importantly, the various treatment options available, including, like I say, a couple of self-help suggestions. So, 
today it's the 23rd of December, Christmas Eve Eve, so I probably won't be seeing you again now till the new year. So until then, have a very happy, healthy, hopefully panic-free Christmas and new year. I'll see you all in 2017. And in the meantime, as always, please enjoy my discussion with Professor Vidya Manikavasaga. Okay, Vidya, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Joining us all the way from Australia as well, which is... Um, yeah. What time is it there? Oh, gosh. Well, for me, it's, it's, it's 10 to 9. Ten, um, but in I the gather morning. That for you, yes, in the morning. But I gather for you, it's probably in the wee hours of the night. So it's, yeah, it's nearly, very good doing. Yeah, nearly 10 o'clock. <laughs> what I'm thinking is, uh, because, of, because of the time difference, this is really convenient for me because the dogs are fed and they're, and they're going to sleep and the kids are in bed and everything. So I think from now on, I might have a, a bit of a, a bias towards people in Australia, like researchers in Australia, because <laughs> it'll just work out better for me. Yeah. The, the other thing before we get into it, I've got to ask, you've, pro you've easily got the coolest name of, of anyone I've had on the, um, on the show so far, Vidya Manika, <laughs> Manika Vasaga. It's an awesome yeah. name. Is it, <laughs> do you know what the meaning is? Has a surname got a meaning yes, to I it? Do. It does have a meaning. It's a, look, it's a Sanskrit name. So it comes from it's the root zone Sanskrit. And it's actually Vidya Lakshmi Manikavasaka, which is even longer. Wow. But uh, Vid Vidya is, is the same name as, as Victoria. It's Victory. Okay. And Manikavasaga is Speaker of Pearls of Wisdom. Oh, wow. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. Which, I mean, it's yeah, that you know that's the surname, but but it's a Sanskrit name. It means um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, it's actually in, in translation, it would be speaker of an ocean of gems. That's what it is. Wow, it is. that's yeah, that's that's a great name. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Um, very very apt as well for somebody that's uh, an academic as oh. well, of course. <laughs> but thank you, Daddy. I, I don't know if I can live up to that expectation, but thank you. <laughs> so. We're here today to talk about uh, panic disorder and agoraphobia. What b before we get into that, what what made you um, steer towards that particular area of research? Ah, well, in my uh, early years in my career, I actually was running an anxiety clinic at one of the very made very big um, large teaching hospitals here in Sydney, and um, because I was running it with a psychiatrist, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Derek Sarlov, and other staff, obviously, we were seeing a huge number of people coming through with anxiety disorders and most notably, obviously, panic disorder, agoraphobia, because that was what the treatment clinic was all about. And because we were studying it so deeply, or we were involved in it, in, in treating people with this disorder so much, um, we started to develop a manual. We started to work out techniques that really worked. We thought really worked because we, we did this over a few years and um, we discovered, you know, that there were different types of panickers, if you like. There are different reasons why people suffer from panic attacks. And one of the more significant findings from all of this was the, uh, the development of a whole body of research into what's called adult separation anxiety disorder which I've written quite a bit about, and, and it's one of my pet areas, actually. So we, what we were looking at was maybe not everyone who suffers from panic attacks is actually suffering from panic disorder. So panic attacks can occur in other disorders as well, but panic disorder obviously is the most common one. So, yeah, so that, that's how we, we got very interested in this area. and be, It was partly because we were seeing so many people come through the clinic, you could start to see patterns emerging. Right. So let's take a, a step back first and kind of define what exactly panic disorder is, what it consists of. Yeah. Okay. So panic disorder is a very specific diagnosis um, in, in the DSM. And now we're up to DSM-5. And I, I think you and, um, you know, your your um, uh, colleagues would, would know very much about panic disorder because you're obviously well informed in this area. But basically panic disorder is... Um, is characterized by what's called panic attacks, which are acute episodes of anxiety, you know, where people experience sweating and rapid heart rate and um, muscle tension, 
breathing difficulty, blood pressure usually drops, there's a surge of adrenaline in the system. So it's a very unpleasant state, which lasts a short period of time, but the after effects kind of linger on, basically. So even if you have a, a panic, one panic attack, there's a sense of dread and fear of another panic attack. And panic disorder is characterized by not only repeated panic attacks, but that dread, that fear of having panic attacks in the future. Yeah, so it's essentially um, a fear of fear. It is. It is very much so. It's a fear of the um, physiological and the psychological uh, signs and symptoms of panic attack, which, which I mean, they are very, very unpleasant. And, you know, um, some research has suggested that up to a third of people, third of, well, I know a third of university students, for that matter, have actually suffered from panic attacks, have had panic attacks. But it's interesting, not everyone goes on to develop panic disorder. So panic attacks are relatively common, but, but perhaps panic disorder, not so. Is, is that probably what it separates somebody from somebody that just has like the occasional panic attack and, and somebody goes on to develop a disorder, would it be that in, in this, this concept of a fear of fear, is it that some people have a panic attack and, and then think, oh God, that was awful, and then leave it behind and it was just one of those things, whereas somebody yeah. will go on to develop a disorder, they'll have the panic attack and then spend a lot of time uh, dwelling on it, ruminating about it and, and, and kind of waiting for it to happen again, feeling kind of very wary about it. Well, yes. Exactly. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's all a matter of, I mean, it, it's quite a complex process because not everyone's physiology is geared up towards anxiety anyway. There's a, there are temperament, temperamental differences. There's physiological differences. Some people just, um, are, 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 I suppose you could say, for want of a different term, sort of more highly strung. So they're more likely to suffer from anxiety anyway because that's just the way they're their bodies are made. That's just the way they are. Um, but that together with what we call anxiety sensitivity um, or a tendency perhaps to catastrophize might actually be, you know, what what might push someone more into the panic disorder area. And, and also if you can attribute your anxiety, your panic attack to something or, you, you, you know, you have a strong feeling, of, oh, yes, I've got these exams coming up and I'm having these panic attacks and I know... It's because I'm tense and I'm anxious about my exam. So you kind of attribute it to something. It, it seems to be less um, fearful than, say, a panic attack that just comes out of the blue for no apparent reason. I mean, that is very frightening. So is, is there some... Does panic attack, the panic disorder kind of exist on, on, on the same continuum as general generalised anxiety disorder? Is it, is it the extreme end of that? Um, or are they two separate conditions? Well, you know, it's... Uh, it's thought that they are separate conditions insofar as depends how far back you want to trace the etiology of panic disorder. Because, I mean, all generalized anxiety disorder, social phobia, um, you know, uh, agoraphobia, all those have a basic bedrock in a sort of a anxiety predisposition, basically. But the disorders themselves are quite different because generalized anxiety disorder is, is a is an anxiety, a worry about events or things that might happen, but not necessarily panic. Um, it's, it's usually characterized by worries about different aspects of one's life. So someone might worry about finances. They might worry about their relationship. They might worry about their children. They might worry about lots of things. They might have panic attacks, but the panic attacks, again, they're attributing it to the worry that they have about such and such. Whereas with panic disorder, People seem to have seem to seem to have become, as you say, fear of fear. They become very very fearful of the symptoms, and the symptoms, the even even uh, slight uh, changes in in their you know the sensations in their body can get them very fearful that it's going to be triggering off another panic attack. So panic becomes panic attacks become the the focus of these of all these worries basically. Yeah, I think just just speaking from experience, when I've, uh, I mean, I, I've, I, I think I, I think I'm I'm through it. Although I might have the occasional one. When I was yeah. kind of in the thick of it with having panic attacks, maybe I was like kind of having them once a day. For me, it really did become. It was almost like just being very suspicious and distrusting of my own physiology. I was just yeah. constantly waiting for 
my body, my brain to have some kind of catastrophic event that was, yeah. well, that was going to kill me. I mean, that was, that seemed to be my, um, that, that seemed to be my thing. I think it's worth pointing out as well is that uh, uh, panic attacks can come in different in different forms for different people so i think when people think of a panic attack they they tend to think of just uh the you know it's that image of somebody um hyperventilating into a paper bag but could you elaborate on that in that it it doesn't necessarily i mean that that wasn't the case for me My, my panic attacks are very different to that has that been the case for you in the patients that you see is these different manifestations of it absolutely because i mean we're all wired differently so you know, some people are more attuned to say, I don't know, the rapid heartbeat or the, um, you know, that feeling, that derealization, depersonalization. Those are symptoms of anxiety. And uh, really, I mean, some people say that they feel like they're walking around in a dream and it just feels awful. Um, or or they might focus a lot on their breathing and, and you know, say that they can't breathe. And that, that worries them. I've had people say they get this choking sensation in their throat and they feel like they yeah that they can't swallow and they and they they get more and more panicky because of that terrible constricted feeling so yes we're all wired differently and we all have different parts of our bodies perhaps that we're a lot more sensitive about um or fearful about so so yes i I think it does um manifest in different ways and just like it also manifests in different ways in terms of the consequences what do you mean by that well well once you've had panic attacks repeated panic attacks and you start worrying about them you know, reoccurring, um, you might start, uh, you know, constricting your lifestyle. So some people might decide, that, yes, that they become very terribly embarrassed about, you know, appearing anxious in public. So, you know, would avoid social situations, avoid anything where, where they might come into contact with other people. Other people might fear that you know, they're going to faint somewhere. So they'd avoid uh, walking out of the house because yeah you might collapse and some terrible disaster might happen you know that, those sort of things or, or other people might find that you know if they go to work um, and have a panic attack in front of colleagues or, or even while they're working they may not be able to concentrate and that's going to have consequences so you know the, the, there's lots of different manifestations basically very individual i think it's worth um just covering covering these two two questions even if it's just for a case of reassurance in in the people i meet the, the panic attacks tend to be in in, in one of two ca- categories and like I say so there's the there's the the rapid heartbeat and the, the the heavy breathing the sweating the really kind of a kind of like a cardiovascular panic attack if you like and then the ones that i experienced were it was it was more like racing thoughts and i feel like i'm you feel like you're going crazy like you're going to lose your mind right there on the spot so just from a clinical perspective, covering those two, because these I think these are the biggest fears for people. One, can a panic attack prove fatal? And secondly, can a panic attack actually push you over the edge? That's the way I used to feel is that it's just I can't I can't hold my mind together and it's going to send me crazy. So are either of those a, a legitimate fear to have? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not familiar with any any study or any research that says that panic attacks can kill you, right? Um, or that you know that some terrible disaster will happen phys- physically from panic attack. I mean, the thing about panic attack is that it, in in and of itself, the actual physiology behind that kind of fear response is is normal. That that's a it's an it's a normal physiological response to a threat. Basically, it's just that the threat is not actually all that real. Yeah. So, so your body's responding as it would if, say, you stood in the middle of the road and a and a lorry came hurtling towards you. You'd have a panic attack, and that would be appropriate. You'd feel like running away. You your heartbeat would race. All those things would happen because that that is what is supposed to happen when you're very fearful. Um. So, so it's a normal response. It's just that it 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 occurs in you know, odd situations or in situations without any provocation, and that's what's so fearful about them. So I, I'm not familiar of any studies that have said that people die from panic attacks. I mean, unless you had a pre-existing condition, I suppose, but then it would be no different from someone who had a fright, but they had a pre-existing condition of, you know, very high blood pressure or very, very serious heart problem anyway, and anything would have triggered off that kind of catastrophic result. So yep. the panic attacks themselves, you know, in, in uh, you know, people who are reasonably healthy is, is not really a, an unusual thing. 
the, the, the thing about going crazy, that is such a common <laughs> symptom. It's actually one of the diagnostic criteria. Um, and no, people do not go crazy with a panic attack, even though you feel like you're going to go crazy. The, the very fact that you worry about going crazy means that you have insight. So you're not actually going to go crazy because the thing is that if you were actually going into a more sort of psychotic state, you wouldn't worry about going into that psychotic state. Yes. You wouldn't have that level of insight. Yes, <laughs> so, I, I do remember reading that and it was quite, yeah. it was quite an, an impactful um, concept for me was this, this idea that Part of part of going crazy, if you like using that terminology, is that you don't yeah. re, you don't realise it's happening, it, and so yeah. like you say, the very fact that you're when you're having a panic attack, you're sitting there thinking, oh my god, I'm losing my mind, I'm going to go crazy. The very fact that you're yeah. thinking that sh it should reassure you that you actually uh, you you are holding everything together, which is what you're trying to do in the first place. It feels it feels awful because you feel very much very disjointed from your surroundings. You feel you know disempowered, and you feel very separate to the people around you and it feels odd it, it just feels very strange the whole process seems strange but but you still there's a part of you that's still able to recognize that this is strange so you haven't actually lost touch with reality and that's what makes it so unpleasant though because that that's what drives the anxiety I mean precisely because you have insight yes just out of interest mm. have, you, have you ever had a panic attack i have i have actually but fortunately i've had panic attacks after I ran a lot of groups on panic disorders, so I actually recognised and knew what to do. <laughs> yeah, but it does. It just, I mean, if, if anyone, if anyone out there listening to this is thinking, oh no, like my panic attacks are worse than everybody else's. Mine are kind of a special sort. No, we all think we're go we're going to die, and it's her it's 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 almost like a living nightmare for those couple of minutes that it's happening. But it's yeah, and we all do think we're going to die. It's not just you. So. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. I think it's worth um, just kind of going over the kind of the basic epidemiology. So, is mm. there is there any tendencies towards certain age groups or different or different genders or anything like that? Sure. Yeah, it's it's thought that um, I mean, in terms of epidemiology, you know, studies vary. They go from one to to eight percent. I mean, the the average, you know, most studies would say it's around five percent lifetime prevalence for panic disorder and um, probably about eight uh, three percent for agoraphobia and and I mean it varies from study to study because it really depends on the sample that you use because if you look at lifetime prevalence some people may not have reached an age where they're going to develop it yet when you're sampling so so it really depends on the sample that you, you select if you select a younger sample you're going to get lower rates than if you select a a very large sample with very broad age groups. So, general rule of thumb is it's around three to five percent for panic disorder and about three percent, two to three percent for agoraphobia. More women than men are affected by panic disorder, and the, it, you know it's not really understood why this is the case, but it does appear that more women are affected. And um, the the onset the onset is around twenty five to thirty years. Oh, so that's a, that's a bit later than um, many things like like anxiety and um, like some of the like some of the more severe mental health disorders. There tends to be a, a bit of an earlier onset. Yeah, like schizophrenia would be slightly earlier than that. Mm. Um, but but you know, the, this, the, we're talking averages here. I mean, of course, it's very, there are a lot of individual differences, and many people with panic disorder would have reported that they suffered from anxiety. You know, from a very early age, they've, they've or they've always suffered from anxiety. So it's not, you know, it's not so clear cut, I guess you could say. But, you know, it, it's thought that in the 20s are when most people are challenged by lots of, well, life stresses and things. Right. I'd like to kind of move on to the, uh, get a little deeper into, into kind of the physiological and, and the psychological aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, a, an important aspect for me that enabled me to kind of get perspective on what was happening to me was learning about the underlying physiology because it's a very physical experience to to have a panic attack. So yeah. if we could kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of invent invent a scenario in which somebody might have a panic attack and then kind of delve into the, the different 
the 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 psychological aspects of of a particular situation and then discuss what's actually happening at a physical level because obviously it's, it's an involuntary process it's like your body and your mind is just going mad on its own and you're just kind yeah. of being dragged along for the ride so yeah. it's it, i think it'd be interesting to delve into them so well where, where should we start with this so let's say what would be a, what would be a common situation that might trigger a panic attack not spontaneously for someone but kind of someone that's already got panic disorder what's a kind of a, a common scenario okay well common a common one that i would i would tend to see is when people um, feel a certain amount of pressure or obligation. You know, they've got lots of things happening in their life. So, for example, they're trying to get the kids ready for school in the morning. They've got to get ready for work and they know they've got some sort of deadline or presentation um, that's coming up as well and their husband is not all that supportive, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, and they might find they get into the car and, um, you know, I think what happens is that people get very busy in their lives. This is a common scenario. And they don't always, while they're busy, recognize what's going on internally. But then you get into the car and you're sitting there and you notice your heart rate is elevated or that you feel a bit sweaty. And someone with a history of panic attacks might start to then think, oh, my gosh, not not – not this on top of everything else. I'm ha going to have a panic attack, and then of course, then those those thoughts about you know dread. Uh, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? You know, and and of course, then your arousal level might go up quite high, and you know that you might actually have the panic attack. So so that would be a very common scenario. So it's um, it, it can it can very much be uh, very cortex based might be the way of uh, it, a very thought based process that the 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 pressures kind of build up from your own. The things that you're thinking and worrying about. Usually, that that seems to be the most common presentation. But of course, you know there are lots and lots of other uh, more physical things that can sort of um, make you more predisposed to develop panic disorder. For example, there is a there is a genetic component to panic disorder. Oh, there so is. We do know that. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. This is interesting because yes. all the yes. interviews I've done so far. Uh, like hmm. with, with depression and uh, schizophrenia, things like that, it seems hmm. to be that the genetics are very fuzzy. Like the, we kind of skim yeah. over the genetics and it's not really very yeah. useful. But the genetic, yeah, the, yeah. there is a genetic component in this with panic disorder. Well, as much as, as probably as much as the others that are fuzzy well, as well. So, okay. So it does, yeah, so it can actually run in families. Like the anxiety tends to run in families, anxiety in general. So, so people, you know, uh, some families, just tend to be more on the aroused sort of anxious spectrum than others. But they do know that through twin studies, and these are twins, you know, identical and non-identical twins, that there does appear to be a, a genetic a constellation of genes, let's say, that are linked to the development of panic disorder and agoraphobia. So, so it, it looks like there are, there are probably a constellation of um, genes that contribute, but then there's a number of other risk factors too. So, it doesn't necessarily mean if you inherit those kind of genes that you're definitely going to get panic disorder because it also depends on the number of environmental precipitants as well. So, for example, I mean, simple things like the amount of caffeine, you know, that people have, tea, coffee, simple things, coke, um, you know, your, your fluctuating sugar levels. If you're not eating properly and you're sort of binging and starving and doing things like that, you're probably more likely to notice all sorts of physiological changes than if you're attuned. If you're so attuned to your body and you're anxious about it, you're probably going to misrepresent or misunderstand those symptoms or those feelings and attribute them maybe to anxiety, even though they might not be. So, so you've got to inherit both the genes and have the environmental stresses together in order to develop the disorder. And that together would say a, a sensitivity to anxiety, a sensitivity to your physical symptoms, and maybe a tendency to catastrophize might actually uh, result in actually panic disorder. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So our, our poor stressed housewife that's just got yes. in the car. So she's, yes. she's uh, all these predispositions and she's feeling stressed and she's suddenly, she notices a heart kind of, kind of beating in her chest. She gets Ooh. gets that little little moment of panic, thinking, "Oh God, like I'm not going to have a panic attack now, am I?" I'm assuming there's a 
there's a there's a moment at which the, f- the physical components kind of kick in and take over. What are they, and what's the what's the process? Yeah, well, well, look, I mean, I, I'm not um, I'm not a, a physiologist, but I do know that adrenaline plays a very big role in all of this. So when when we start to feel or feel threatened or sense that something bad is going to happen, usually. Um, we produce a lot of adrenaline or adrenaline gets released into the bloodstream. And, of course, that's got huge num- numbers of effects on the body. So one of them is the racing heart, but it mobilizes your muscles for the fight or flight response. Um, and it suppresses your immune system, for example. So that's why, you know, when people are under a lot of stress, they're probably more likely to catch colds and do all sorts of things, catch, mm. catch all sorts of horrible nasties as well. And it results in the production of cortisone and, and cortisone, you know, elevated levels of cortisone in your body are not actually very good for you. They, they help you with, because it reduces inflammation in case you're going to get hurt. And that's really what the fight or flight response is all about. It's trying to prepare you for some terrible disaster. But, but if the disaster is actually in your mind, it's not actually happening. Your body's still responding to it as if it was a real disaster, a real threat, I guess. So, um, so physiologically, that's what's happening. And over time, I mean, that can have a very wearing effect on your body. So it's, it's actually not good at that physical level to, to be suffering from anxiety for very extended periods of time. What, what about the, the, the role of the amygdala? Yeah, I know you, you've asked me about that, Danny. And I, I must admit, I, I, I've seen it implicated in some of the other anxiety disorders. I, I don't know. And this is just my own ignorance. So... It doesn't mean that it's not implicated. I I just do not know. Um, I know there there have been studies looking at it in social phobia, um, but I, I honestly don't know. And I, but you know it's it's very hard to um, the the problem with with a lot of this uh, the the uh, neurological studies like that is that you don't know which came first. You know is is it the fact that you have panic disorder that results in some sort of um, you know, problem in the way certain parts of your brain work. You know that you get when you when you when you do PET studies, PET scans and stuff like that. Your certain parts of your brain light up, but it might just be because that's just a, a you know, a, an indication of the level of anxiety. It's not necessarily the cause of it. Yeah. It might be correlational. Yeah. So so it's, it's hard to to actually pinpoint. Is it actually because of that, I, I, you'd have to do you'd have to do longitudinal studies of a large number of people and get them to come in for constant scans to see whether right. that was actually related to it. But no one's done that; it's too expensive. You can't you can't do that. So you know, many of the studies are done on people who have the disorder already. So we don't always know whether it's, it's cause, causal or correlational. Yeah, just so just for for, for any, anyone listening who doesn't know. So I mean my very primitive understanding of it is the amygdala is like the a part of the the the, the reptilian the primitive part of the brain yeah. uh, and it's like yeah. the 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 emotional memory center. So um yeah, my understanding of it is any kind of um any kind of traumatic events that happen in life they're stored as emotional memory in the amygdala. Yeah. Um and so it could be that uh Again, I'm I'm just riffing here, and, and cut me cut me off if I'm if I'm if if I'm talking rubbish. Um, so so say it was something situational, and I'm I'm kind of creeping into the agoraphobia side of things, um, kind of going there. For me, I think the way my agoraphobia crept in was, I I remember having a panic attack in a shopping centre, and then. For me, it was the shopping center's fault. Like it wasn't me that did it. Thinking about it, it was the shopping center, and it was. And then, almost automatically, then every time I I entered a situation that was like a shopping center or anything like that, it was it was like a like a light switch, and I just yeah, immediately yeah. immediately go into that panic mode. And like you say, that's it, it's tricky to know whether that's me thinking about and preparing <laughs> yeah. for going into the shopping center. Or whether yeah. the, the amygdala's kicked in and the emotional memory center and you know that's there to that's there to protect you has gone. Well, we can't go in there because that that place is going to kill you. So yes, yes, it's it's got a protective function. And you're you're absolutely right because 
I mean, these kind of brain structures developed precisely to keep us alive. And, you know, if there was a, a benefit in learning what caused or, you know, to, to actually take us away from situations which potentially could kill us, that's why those, those structures actually evolved and stayed stick stuck around, basically. Yeah. So, you know, you, there's a huge element of conditioning that goes on in, in um, the development of agoraphobia. You, you, when, you see, when, when you condition to um, uh, things, stimuli, stimuli in the environment, the best conditions under which you will develop a conditioned response is if your anxiety level is high, and that's precisely yeah. what happens with anxiety disorders. So you walk into the shopping center, maybe, maybe, okay, say you've never had a panic disorder, a panic attack before, but you walk in and you start to feel anxious and you have the panic attack. Now already then your anxiety level is very high, so obviously the surroundings are then going to become associated with that with that anxiety. So the next time you go there, there's a classical conditioning type of uh, process going on. You just associate. It's at an unconscious level. It's not your fault. It's yeah. just, that's just the way everyone's brains are wired. You just associate shopping centers with anxiety, basically. Yes. I think um, I think a good example of uh, the amygdala at work for people um, that we've all we've all kind of experienced is. Say if you um, if you you go you walk into your bedroom in the dead of night and all the lights are switched off and then you can you open the door and you see a figure standing there and you jump mm. and then a couple of seconds yeah. later you 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 gather your thoughts and then yeah. you realise oh it, you know you switch the light on it's just the dressing gown hanging over the mirror kind of thing yeah. and the point of the amygdala is if if you just walked into the bedroom and stood there staring through the darkness just thinking about it too long, well, that could be an axe murderer. And if you stand there thinking about it, you're going to get your head yeah. chopped off. So the, amygd exactly. the, the amygdala's job is to get you the hell out of there as quickly as possible, um, which is, yeah, very much the very much the, the, the kind of sensation I got when it was, like I say, go, going into shopping centres or anything. And the, the move of what I'm making into, into agoraphobia now, I, I know a lot of people will be wondering why we're discussing the two in the same conversation agoraphobia is now understood as, as a um a complication of panic disorder is is that mm. is that the case is that how you un is that your understanding of it? it it is but you can actually develop yeah i mean you can become you can have agoraphobia without panic attacks you can have without panic disorder um you can still develop agoraphobia it's less likely to happen but it is possible so some people will have what's called subclinical panic attacks. So they'll have some symptoms, not others. Or they might fear certain things. Um, so for example, they fear fainting or they fear, um, you know, um, I don't know, losing control of their bowels or something. Um, so, so it's like one or two symptoms. It's not quite a panic attack, but they fear something happening out, out there. And so they become agoraphobic, basically. So you don't have to have panic disorder, but it is rarer. It's it's a, it's very much associated with panic disorder. Yeah, it seemed it it was very much for me that, um, and I think a lot of people might be able to relate to this. Uh, again, with that example, is I think um, I think a good way of putting the way agoraphobia creeps in for me as a result of the panic disorder is even though we like to think of ourselves as these kind of social butterflies and we're all over the place and traveling the world and things. The truth is, we've got like. 10 places that we go to on a regular basis really you know you've got work and your parents house maybe your sisters and things like that and what happened for me was so I had a panic attack in the shopping center and then I couldn't go to the shopping center anymore and then I had a panic attack at work so I can't go to work anymore I have to quit my job you have a panic attack in in, in all these places and then you, your world just kind of gets smaller and smaller until um well until you, you you're stuck at home for six months like I was at, at, at one point is that is is that the general way that panic disorder kind of creeps into becoming agoraphobia, or is is the other ways of that happening? In panic disorder, the way you've described it is is probably the most common. That that is the way that it usually develops. That's exactly what it is. It's a restriction in your lifestyle, a constriction, if you like, of all the things out there that potentially could, uh, you know, cause or lead you to have another panic attack. So it's a fear of panic attacks, and it's a fear. Of having panic attacks in in situations, or a fear also of getting out of those situations should you have a panic attack. So there's a bit of a cognitive process going on here where you might not have been in certain situations, but you can anticipate that if you were in that crowd, or if you were 
involved in that particular activity, getting help if you had a panic attack would be very difficult. It would be very difficult to extricate yourself from that situation. So there's, it, it's the corollary of, of having the panic attack. And, and the way you've described it is actually very common. But it's also interesting, Danny, that that very constriction of lifestyle is what might maintain panic attacks as well because the the more restrictive the lifestyle the more the less likelihood you have other you know sources of stimulation or enjoyment to to focus on it becomes it becomes more and more um you know restrictive basically just you know you're the 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 positive events that you have become less and less simply because there's less opportunity to experience them yeah it's it was it was a strange little strange kind of dichotomy for me in that it was on the one hand it like you say it's very restrictive and that kind of i think for me that's where kind of elements of depression kind of start to kick in but at the set at the same time it's i've all i've always said for me at least the the agoraphobia was like the easiest phobia in the world to have because it was basically just i just relax at home i watch telly i order pizza and nowadays I and mean, you don't even have to go out to the supermarket to buy your shopping they'll deliver it straight to your door and it's a very it's a it's a very easy phobia to maintain and also there wasn't much leverage there for me to change because it, it can be very kind of it can all i very much got comfortable with with being in that situation and very much got used to it this is just this is just the way life is now and like i say in the modern age you don't you don't really have to you don't really have to um leave the house at all so <laughs> you don't, you don't. But, but but there's also a difference uh, well i suppose yes you're right in the modern age i mean there's just about any, every anything you could do on the internet but it depends on whether also your, your temperament because i mean for some people they do actually um crave you know say if you were highly extroverted um, and craved stimulation from other people, it, it would be torture being, right. being at home. It would be quite difficult. Um, but if you were more, you know, if your pursuits were more introverted, if you enjoyed reading and, and doing things on your own, or you could actually occupy yourself and you're quite happy with your own company, then yes, agoraphobia is yeah, it's not no big deal, really. Yeah, well, that's that. That describes me exactly. Very, very introverted. Like to just sit and read books, and yeah, very much yeah. kind of like my own company. So, yeah. yeah, very interesting. Just before we kind of move on to um, what people can actually do about this, um, I just wanted to make see if there was a distinction to be made. But when a moment ago you said that agoraphobia can exist without the panic disorder, but it sounded yeah. it sounded very much like it was fueled by. Uh, it sounded more like a social phobia. What, yeah, what's yeah. the distinction to be made between the two? Or is it very, very yeah. much a crossover? Well, no, no, there is a distinction. So with social phobia, people, people fear... Um, they, they, look, they, they fear that people are going to look down on them in some way. So they, they fear that they're going to say or do the wrong thing. And in some way, um, people are going to judge them. So they, they, they worry about that sort of evaluation by others and quite often they have thoughts that take them to places where it's quite unrealistic they might set very unrealistic set expectations for how they should behave in certain situations or they might have very distorted ideas about people or how people might interpret what they say and do so that's the more social phobia and of course i mean there are elements which are similar to agoraphobia in terms of People with social phobia often fear blushing because they fear they blush in public. People will think that they're embarrassed, and if they think they're embarrassed, they'll think they're incompetent. You know that sort of stuff. But it's all to do with their performance in a social situation. In agoraphobia, it's slightly different in the sense that well, it is different because people fear symptoms. That's really what they fear. They fear the physical symptoms of something or other, and they, it's, it, you know, like someone with agoraphobia could go out could fear going to a train station. So they don't know anyone in the train station, but they fear that they're going to faint, say, for example. So it's, an, it's, it's only the evaluation by others if some, something happens, some, something to attract attention to them that is out of the norm. Yeah. And I mean, certainly someone fainting is unusual. I mean, really, that's not, that's not the norm. So that there is a, a, an element of reality there because, yes, everyone would pay attention if you fainted at a train, train platform. 
But but that's precisely what they worry about. They worry about the physical symptoms that they'll get when they're out in public and that they can't get away. And if they get away, they'll be able to, those symptoms will subside, but they can't get away because there's so many people or they're locked in a queue or whatever it is that yeah. can't get them out of the situation. Yeah, so that very, that kind of, um, that kind of pop culture image or the, the kind of standard definition of agoraphobia being a fear of open spaces, that, yeah. that's in, yeah. an inaccurate de- description. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's absolutely wrong. I mean, agoraphobia is a fear of the marketplace in, in Greek, I think. But uh, but it's not that. It's actually fear of, fear of the symptoms. It's fear of um, you know something happening to you in public or, or out there where you can't get help or you can't get away. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember there was um, a, one of the other things I quit doing was taking the dogs for a walk. So going out walking mm. in any kind of fields where I was I was on my own. And again, I I came to believe that it was it's a very much objectification of the fear so it's the fields it's the open space that are doing it yeah. but you're right yeah. it, 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 for me it was it was that the idea that i'm out here all on my own i can go crazy on my own or yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. feel i'm gonna feel dizzy or like a passing out yeah. again that's that was another one of mine i'm constantly obsessed i was gonna pass out in the middle of a field and no one would find yeah. me and i couldn't get help yeah. And yeah the thing that's interesting about it is until somebody kind of points that out to you you do believe that it's the the place that's doing it and that it's not you that's doing it. Yeah, yeah. And and that's where treatment comes in. I mean, you know, really the treatment for agoraphobia is what, what's called graded exposure. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, accurate or the, the best treatment for agoraphobia would be to learn a number of skills to help control your anxiety, but then to actually have a, a, a hierarchy of graded exposure situations where you can actually go out and test out some of these these skills using the skills in those situations, but together with that, what what works best um, according to the literature is, I mean, obviously cognitive behavior therapy is, is like the mainstay, but one of the best treatments for panic disorder and agoraphobia is what's called um, interceptive, um, you know, conditioning where you, oh, not conditioning, sorry, but interceptive exposure where you actually um, induce the symptoms of panic and handle it you know you kind of sit with it and realize that nothing is actually going to happen because the other thing also is that you see that the physiology of panic with adrenaline and all the chemicals that get poured out of your body in order to sustain that level of anxiety it's not unlimited your body can't keep producing those chemicals for a long period of time I mean I think one study I read they said that you can only panic for about 10 to 15 minutes because by then you would have depleted all the reserves of whatever it was that the body is trying to, to pour into the bloodstream, and it needs time to actually create those chemicals again. Yep. You can't actually panic for longer than that time. But what you can do is you can feel fear. You can be apprehensive and fearful of having a panic attack or, or feeling that level of anxiety for a long period of time after. But you won't have the acute symptoms because you can't. Physiologically, you just can't. Is that something that you feel that, it is best done under supervision. Oh yes, yes, it's probably best done under supervision. But initially, and then, and then, of course, once you learn how to do it, then it may be something that you could practice in your own time and report back or, or consult a health professional about how you're going and things that you might be might be doing to refine it. Like a simple example uh, would be, say, someone who fears that when their heart races, it means that that's going to be a panic attack, or if their heart races, that could trigger off a panic attack. But one of, one of the strategies would be to get them to run up and down the stairs a few times, feel their heart beating very fast, sit there, and just focus on their heartbeat and actually just wait it out till your heart settles, heartbeat settles. Or um, getting into you know one of those swivel chairs and swiveling around, feeling very dizzy. Yes. And then, yeah, experiencing that sensation and just handling it. But, but, it, but it does take, um, you know, uh, you, you have to do it initially at least, uh, perhaps under under a bit of supervision because if if that's just likely to just tip you into feeling yes oh, this is terrible and this is going to bring on a panic attack then it might actually bring on a panic attack so it's it's best done if you've already learnt some skills in terms of controlling anxiety and then you use use some of those skills to you know modulate how you're reacting to things. Um, a couple of the things that you mention in your book, uh, which I just kind of like to. If you could give us a kind of brief insight into what they involve, uh, one of them is 
identifying triggers. Yeah. So what would that what would that consist of? Well, well, there are some you know there are some things that would um, be more likely to raise your level of general level of anxiety, your sort of your ambient level of arousal, and would make it more likely that come a stress you might be more likely to trigger off that anxiety. So so the triggers might be either the what we call proximal or distal triggers. So so you could you could have long term things that, that you do lifestyle things that are that are probably not so good for you and then specific triggers. So specific triggers might be a fight with your partner or um the boss yelling at you at work or um, um having a deadline. So those kind of triggers could occur. But, but you can also have, obviously, physical triggers like, I mean, drug and alcohol abuse will do it. Uh, high levels of nicotine, you know, smoking will, will do it. Um, some physical illnesses will make it more life, likely that you, you, you experience physical symptoms and then they could act as triggers as well. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but yeah. Yes, it did. My next one was, I, I'm just at... And I know people are going to be listening to this and thinking, right, right, this is great, this is great, whatever. But the main thing they're going to want to know, because this is what I would have wanted to know, is yeah. what do you, what to actually do once you've gone, once you've hit that point where the panic attack's coming, it's coming, yeah. like it, you, you, you yeah. you've, you've, you've gone over the, you've gone over the edge, and it's going to kick in. What do you do then? How, how, do, how do you, how do you best handle that so that? Again, the 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 whole point of this is it, it's a fear of fear. It's a fear of fear. It is. Yes, it is. So how can you get into that place that even when the panic attack strikes, you can almost just instead of clinging on for dear life, you yeah, can just sort yeah. of relax into it and just let it happen. How do you? Yeah. How do you do that? Well, I mean, it depends on on how how brave you are, I guess, I mean, uh, how courageous you are to, to do something like this. And it depends on how long you've been suffering from the attacks. So, I mean, if you've had it for a while, you kind of get into the understanding of, yeah, I've had these before and I know they're very unpleasant, but, you know, I can wait it out or whatever. But obviously, if you're new to it, it, it is very, very upsetting. I mean, I personally found that when I have had panic attacks in the past, just holding my breath, Against my judgment and against my feeling, but holding my breath and counting to ten settles it. Okay, the slow breathing really makes a big difference. The other technique, of course, techniques. There's a whole group of techniques in this. Is distraction because if you distract yourself away from it as much as you can, you can actually stop it from happening because because it's focusing on those symptoms and catastrophizing those symptoms that quite often drives the anxiety. So, so, so say, for example, you start you're feeling, you're feeling like you're starting to get a panic attack and you could quickly listen to your favorite piece of music that engages you, mm -hmm. that might help. I mean, it's not always all that easy to do because you might not be in a situation where you can do that. Or even if you've got a, a friend that knows about the panic attack and you can call them and immediately say, hey, look, can you just talk to me? Tell me something that's happened to you today so that I can kind of get my mind off this. That will also help. So distraction is a really good way of doing it. But you have to probably have organized what sort of things you're going to use to distract yourself prior to that so that when the time comes, you know this is what's going to distract me. Yep. There's another technique called the rubber band technique, which you probably know about. It's just where you wear a rubber band around your wrist and it's, you know, the pain actually brings you back to reality. Yeah, you snap the, you snap the rubber band on, yeah. onto your wrist. Yeah. Onto your wrist, yes. But, but you have to still, after that, you still have to then implement something that will stop the panic attack and the breathing exercise is probably the best one because you're talking about acute or you know immediate strategy so slow breathing is one of the ones that will really help with panic attack yeah a couple of i think a couple of things that i did kind of re reframing it one was i know this sounds kind of bizarre but is appreciating that your body's trying to help you yeah all those millions of years of evolution it's it's yeah. it's your body's trying to do you a favor even though you're in a, in a panicky in, in a situation that might be completely fine and nothing's going to happen to you your body's trying to help you and it's just kind of it's just kind of saying well for me it was just it was just like you know thanks for this but i'm okay i don't really need your help <laughs> um yeah that's, that's a terrific way of doing it Danny. honestly that's yeah yeah and, <laughs> because, and that's right. You're normalizing the situation. Yes. The other one yeah. was, um, I, I kind of, I, I used a bit of an analogy for myself. So 
having having a panic attack because it's involuntary and I don't want it to be happening and it's horrendous. I kind of likened it to somebody I don't like putting me on a roller coaster against my will. And so I used to, I thought that the way to kind of give them that person satisfaction would be to cling on for dear life and scream your head off on the roller coaster all the way around. So what, what I did instead was when I felt it kind of coming on, I just sort of close my eyes and relax into it and just say, right, fine. Like I'm, I'm on the roller coaster. I've got no choice but to go, but I'm, I'm just going to go along for the ride and I'm not going to give you any satisfaction out of it. I'm, I'm going to make this very boring for you. Yes. Yes, it does. That's called panic surfing. And it's where you just get into the panic and just let it ride. Because yeah. as, as I said, the physiology will only last a, a short time. The, the actual chemicals that get released can only last for a short time. But if you just let it, let it rip. <laughs> And, and yeah, and, and use those kind of cognitive strategies because they're true. I mean, it is, it is your body trying to do you a favor because for whatever reason, um, it's turned on what's called a false alarm system. You know, I, it's, it's a bit like, they say it's a bit like, um, you know, when you go to a shopping center and sometimes when you walk out of a department store, the, the sensors go off and you haven't done anything. Yeah. But it, it behaves like you've stolen something. But it's just an oversensitive sensor, basically. It is. And, yeah, you just ignore it basically. Yeah, and, and I think I think the other thing is it, it we, we do, we're doing those kind of uh, giving yourself a bit of perspective on it. I felt like it chipped away at it over time, so it wasn't like um, I, just one day I just stopped having panic attacks. It was the so you, 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 say you have a panic attack at a hundred at a hundred percent, but you don't you don't yeah. fear it that much, and you and you like you say you I quite like that idea. You surf panic surfing, yeah. and then next time you might have only knocked 1% off it. So it's 99% as bad as it was the first yeah. time. But then you yeah. just do it again and you knock that 1% off every time until yeah. it just doesn't happen anymore. And that's precisely what, yeah. what it was like for me. So before I, we kind of wrap this up and get into the, the hypothetical philosophical questions I like to run by everybody, is there any kind of... Is there any recommendations, like hard and fast recommendations you would make for people when it comes to seeking treatment? Well, I think one of the things I would say is really, you know, seek treatment early because the, the average time that people take to, to seek treatment could be anything between five to ten years. Wow. People don't always seek treatment initially because they think, oh, it's nothing, it'll pass, or I'm embarrassed about it, I shouldn't be having things like that, you know, for whatever reason. And, and, you know, time and time again, uh, research has shown that most people actually don't seek help. In Australia, one in four people would have an, a lifetime anxiety disorder. It's very high, but, you know, one in four. Um, but of the people who do actually suffer from, say, panic dis attacks or panic disorder, only one in five seek treatment. Wow. So, you know, we're really talking about small numbers here. It, it, it doesn't always just pass. You know, they, they say only 10% of panic attacks or panic disorder patients will really just recover spontaneously. If you have panic disorder, you really do need to seek help because there are some very good strategies out there. I mean, a, this is one of the more heavily researched areas, actually, of the anxiety disorders. There's lots and lots of strategies out there. There's lots of um, uh, material about how to treat panic attacks and agoraphobia. So I'd say seek help early. The other thing also is that, you know, as a hard and fast rule, I think what, what people might, what might help also is if you are suffering from anxiety, start off with looking at your lifestyle in terms of are there any things in your lifestyle that could be modified or could be, um, you know, changed in some way that, that would make it less likely that you, you're feeding into the anxiety. So make, make sure you get adequate sleep, going to sleep at a certain time. It's probably a boring, a boring kind of recommendation, but eating three meals a day, you know, um, cutting down on caffeine and sugars, you know, that kind of stuff. The, the lifestyle factors can play a huge role. Just before we finish on that, on that note, I just wanted to tell you, I had a, I treated someone who was an airline, uh, stewardess actually with panic disorder. And in the course of the assessment, I asked her about her day. I said, so how do, how do you actually start the day? What, what, what's your typical day? And she said, well, as you know, my uh, day is made up of, uh, you know, it can be quite chaotic because I could be flying anywhere and whatever. And she said, so I start the day with four cups of coffee. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, four I'll cups of it. coffee, right. And yes. So I thought consecutive cups. But no, she actually made four cups of coffee and drank them one after the wow. other. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And the the really the treatment for her was so easy. I just said, well, you know, cut out the coffee or, or reduce the amount of coffee. And sure enough, your panic attack stopped. Yeah, the thing is as well, I think with a, a lot of kind of the, the ways we treat ourselves in, in response to the way we're feeling, but in trying to make ourselves mm. feel better with coffee, yeah. with drinking, with uh, eating fast food. Yeah. The things that make it help, help us feel better in the short term, they just exacerbate the problem in the long term. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So true. So true. And they're so, they, they, you, because, you know, our brains are not always wired to see the long term implications. The way our brains work is to look for immediate threat. So, you know, with, with lifestyle factors, they're, they're long term things, but they do actually make an impact. But it's very hard to, put two and two together to see the correlation yeah all, all those things sleep uh, diet all i'm g- going to be getting into all those in depth at some point so um yeah yeah definitely okay let's move on to the the hypotheticals so do you have any book recommendations on this topic besides your own which i will be putting in the show notes <laughs> thank you well there's a, there's a colleague of mine sarah edelman who has written a book called change your thinking and she's somewhat of an expert in anxiety disorders, and she she's written quite a bit about the use of CBT uh, in in treating anxiety. I, w- I would recommend hers, but look, I don't have any other recommendations mainly because there are so many books out there. All all I could say is that I think if if you're looking for self help material, make sure it's written by a reputable health professional because there's also a lot of very strange stuff out there as well, mm-hmm. and and yeah, and it's not always helpful. Yeah, that's it. That's it. exactly precisely the premise of this podcast is to stay clear of the the pseudo science and the self help gurus and yeah. all that. Yeah, not helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I told you this before. I'm going to commandeer this question from you. So the the second question is: If you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked, however niche or bizarre, what would it be and why? But <laughs> like I said, I'm commandeering that question because you're involved in building an app, uh, a, a mobile app called Spark. Yeah. Yeah. And I find it, I've read up on it and I find it fascinating. So I just wondered if you could um, kind of expand on what that is, because I think it's something that the, the listeners might be interested in getting involved in. So, Sure. Well, yeah, Spark is an app. It's, it's nearly ready. It's nearly um, complete. But it's, it was developed because um, my background is also in what's called positive psychology. So rather than just focusing on the negative emotions and symptoms and things like that of psychopathology, I'm also interested in what what keeps us, uh, you know, feeling good about ourselves. What what helps us to flourish? What 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 actually gives us those you know wonderful feelings that we have the motivation to do things? And um, along those lines, I guess I, I've been researching this area of positive psychology. And one of the big big uh, areas that comes into play here about what keeps people fulfilled and satisfied and even flourishing in their lives is doing things and living your life according to your values. If you, if you can, I mean, even identifying your values actually is a challenge for a lot of people because many people don't even know what their values are. But certainly, if you can identify what's important to you and then map out, you know, how you might live your life according to those values, a little bit more congruent with those values, most people would find that they derive a lot more satisfaction and feel a lot more fulfilled and motivated with what they're doing simply because that that's attuned to to who they are, and um, we've developed this app to help you identify your top three values. And there are fifty possible values on this on the app, but it identifies the top three. And then the second stage of its development will involve giving you suggestions as to how you might actually um, incorporate those values into your life. What sort of things you might want to do? Little steps, baby steps that might actually help you gain some uh, ideas to move on and move your life in that direction uh, of, of your values. And it's interesting because our app developer, when we first uh, started developing this app about two years ago, we uh, we used an app developing company and, and in particular uh, an, uh, an app developer that we worked very closely with. And he was working on this app with us. And just last year, he'd been working so closely with us that he'd re- discovered that his values were not congruent with the company that he was working with. Wow, and yeah. he actually left. He left the yeah. company and started his own company. And he's absolutely flourishing. I mean, he's doing so well and he's employed other people and he's 
doing other apps and other projects which are similar to ours. Um, but he's so grateful that, that he not only identified what was important to him, but then realized that the way he was living his life was getting further and further away from what he considered important to him. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I, uh, for me, the idea of in getting values involved in recovering from mental health is 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 big and important as well. Not just be, mm. not just in the sense of trying to improve your life, get a better job, things like that. But for me, it was very much a, a quick example would be when I when like I say when I had the, the agoraphobia. I didn't have the leverage to get better because things like going out, you know, I'm not socialized and I haven't been, I don't really care about those things. But what I did, yeah. what I did care about, what was massively important to me is being a good father. Now, because I wasn't yeah. going out, my, yeah. my little boy was suffering from it as well. So when I identified that value that it's important to me to yeah. be a good father, that gave me the leverage then to get up off my ass and do something about it. Because if, if it was just the case of trying to go out to the pub every Friday night and trying to have a better social life, yeah, I'm a bit indifferent about those things, but when I mm. identified my value, my, what was important to mm. me, that gave me the leverage okay. to actually do any, do something about it. So I think it's massively important. So I think it sounds like a, a brilliant idea. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a very good example, Danny. I mean, really, and it's, I'm so glad that you know you you've managed to identify that that area in your life that was very beneficial in moving you along. Okay, if you could take over the government for a day. What policy okay. would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Now, think oh, big. God, you, could just, you could be you could be a dictator. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. <laughs> oh God! Well, if if I could, if I could, I suppose regarding mental health, I do see. I mean, my my area, my my passion, I suppose, is anxiety. You know, and I see that as quite a very uh, you know it's a destructive force for, for a lot of people actually. I mean when you think about it in Australia it's one in four um, with, an, with a lifetime likelihood of developing an anxiety disorder. That's, that's quite a lot and you know people make decisions and live their lives um, with these kind of anxieties which are so treatable. I think if I had a lot of money and if I had government, you know, government behind me, I think introducing anxiety management strategies in schools would be a great idea. Getting kids attuned to you know, better, healthy lifestyle and actually living your life in a more calmer, more, um, you know, more metered way would be, would be better, would benefit society, I think. Yeah, totally. Prevention's better than cure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the best piece of advice anybody has ever given you? <laughs> I saw this question. Now, I actually don't have an answer for this one, mainly because it really depends on you know, the, the situation and the, at where I was in life at that time. Because the best piece of advice at one time was not necessarily the best piece of advice at other times. But I think what happens is, well, the best piece of advice, I suppose, if I can answer that in a bit of an obtuse way, is the advice you give yourself. And I think I'm a great one for self-talk. And quite often, I'm the one who is my own motivator and my own sort of um, cheer squad. And I think... You know, if we all develop that a little bit more, I think there's, there's benefit to it. Not in a narcissistic way, mm. but certainly in a way that, that's, uh, you know, encouraging and uh, reflective of self-respect, really. Yeah, just being, being a bit nicer to yourself. Yes, yes. And, and encouraging, you know, acknowledging your successes, acknowledging who you are and what you are so that you don't want to, you know, try to be someone else that you're really not or you're, you know, that you're working towards being dissatisfied about where you are because you want to be just like someone else who it would just completely unrealistic. I, th I think it's, it's that know yourself and be your own advocate, basically. Yeah, I like that. Be your own cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not in a narcissistic way, though. <laughs> final two. Outside, oh no, sorry, final three. What, what part of your career are you most proud of? Well, actually, the part that I'm most proud of is all the work that I did with panic disorder resulted in um, a whole body of research into separation anxiety disorder. And I guess in a nutshell, Danny, it's the research that I did over 10 years with my, a lot of other people, of course, and my colleagues who are fabulous, um, resulted in a change in the DSM. So DSM-5 actually reflected changes based on the research that we, we did, based oh, wow. on saying that separation anxiety disorder, which was thought to be a childhood disorder, can actually continue into adulthood. 
that people, adults, can suffer from separation anxiety and suffer from panic attacks, and it's not panic disorder. So that was a big thing, and I'm very proud of that. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfilment? Um, well, a few years ago, I started studying Sanskrit. It's an ancient language, <laughs> and it's completely useless in modern life because no one speaks it. And it's, it's, it's like ancient Greek or like the ancient Latin. But it was absolutely fascinating because it gave you insight into how people thought and what they considered important, their values, 3,000 years ago. And it, it's absolutely fascinating to, to read some of those things in the original language. I loved it. Are you, are you quite proficient in Sanskrit now? No, I'd love to say I was. I've only got a diploma in it. I did four years of it at Sydney University, and although I wanted to continue with it, it it's a very time-consuming activity, and I think I'd have to wait till I retire completely before <laughs> I can actually do it a little bit more. It's a bit very, very tricky, but it is incredibly rewarding. So I'd say, you know, if you if you study a different language and get insight into other cultures, I think that it, it really broadens your perspective and, uh, you know, gives you insight, a little bit more insight. Okay, final question. The, the the biggest one. What do you think is the key to happiness? Uh -huh. <laughs> Again, I think it has to do with living your life according to your values. I really do, actually. I mean, I wasn't so sure about it until we started working on Spark. And I started to see, you know, there's a whole body, there's also a body of literature about values and things like that. But, you know, just from personal experience and from what I've found talking to colleagues and talking to other patients that I've had and so on, if you if your life is so discordant with who you are, really, that's a recipe for disaster. And once you align those values with who you are and what you're doing, I think, yes, most people feel very, very much more um, contented and happy. Okay, Vijay, thank you very much. Is there any links, uh, anything on social media you'd like to direct the listeners towards? Um, I don't, I don't actually have any, any links, believe it or not, I'm a bit of a Luddite, so I actually have no Facebook, no, <laughs> no links or, at all on my part, but, but certainly the Black Dog Institute, if people are interested, they should follow the Black Dog Institute, um, because there's a whole bunch of uh, resources there for anxiety, um, and, and also for, in positive psychology as well, on the Black Dog Institute website, so, yeah. Okay, perfect. Vijaya, thank you very much. My pleasure, Danny. Thank you so much. As always, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so at myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find all the show notes and links to any relevant information. If you'd like to contact me, I'm Danny D. Whittaker with two T's on all the various social medias. If you'd like to send me an email, you can do so at danny at myownworstenemy.org. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by sharing links to your favorite episodes with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. And also, you can subscribe via iTunes, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy. So, as always, until we meet again, behave yourselves, but not too much, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>